And I'm Dr. Adam Jirachi. And you are listening to Love's a Secret Weapon podcast. Hi, this is Adam Jirachi and welcome back to Love's a Secret Weapon podcast. Today, Donna continues reading from chapter 13, Let's Pretend. That's the title of one of our songs, which you'll hear soon. And over the next several weeks, as we head into the holidays, we have a very special guest, Donna's agent from her time on Shindig, John Hartman. Our podcast was created using Anchor, the free platform for creating and distributing podcasts, and we're proud to be on their platform and to be distributed all over the web. Thanks, Anchor. We ask one small favour of you, our listeners. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast on your favourite platform. Not only does this mean that you'll get notified whenever we have a new episode, but it also lets our distributors know that you like our show. And please also leave us a review. Before we go to Donna's reading, I have some exciting news. Donna's CD, These Are The Good Times, the complete capital recordings, has been reissued due to popular demand. These Are The Good Times is a compilation first released in 2014 of all of Donna's capital recordings from the 60s, including unreleased tracks that were securely in the vault. The compilation received sterling reviews on its release and was a 2014 Gold Bonus Disc Award winner. Well back in stock for the holidays, to order your personally signed copy, go to store.donnalauren.net. Now that's enough from me, over to Donna and let's pretend. You love me. I died the day you said goodbye. I want to hear you say you love me, even if it's so long. Let's Pretend, Part 3. I became pregnant with my second child, my daughter Anna. Practicing Tai Chi as well as feeding my body in a smart way revitalized me. Feeling in tip-top shape, I accepted an invitation in February when Lenny got a call from his father in Mexico. Sai told him, I've sold the yacht and I bought a house in Puerto Vallarta. I want you to come and visit me. My little family of three packed up our south-of-the-border wardrobe and ventured into unchartered territory. There was a level of discomfort for Lenny not being in his own domain, but he was excited about one thing. He could go into an over-the-counter pharmacy in Mexico and get medicine that he couldn't in the U.S. without a prescription. I was excited about going to Mexico because I had never been there. We arrived at his dad's place, which was perched up on a hill overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Within view of his house was a river that emptied out into the ocean. In the river was a donkey and a woman and a child. The woman was scrubbing herself and her child with soap suds, and you could see the bubbles floating down the river to the ocean. (laughs) That was my introduction to Mexico. The next day, Lenny's dad took us in town to show us around. Sai drove us down the main road where Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton had their villa, which was an all-white Spanish style. It started on one side of the road with a bridge connecting it to the other side of the road, and passing under the bridge were vivid red bougainvillea. Walking down the cobblestones was a little difficult because I was pregnant, but I was wearing a pair of my very favorite Donald Pliner shoes that were 
cork and platform fashioned a kind of rock back and forth from heel to toe, which made it easier to walk on an uneven surface. I wore them constantly during my pregnancy, and I wish I still had them. We were more or less tourists looking around and experiencing the culture there. I admired the hand-embroidered garments and found them to be very useful as well as beautiful. I bought an orange melon-colored top that fit my needs while I was pregnant because of the full gathering above the bus line. This visit was essentially to spend quality time with Lenny's dad for a few days, and so we soon returned to Sai's house. The afternoon sun was intense. Lenny's mother was Austrian, with quite sensitive skin and a pale complexion, and he inherited her skin type. Sai was more like me, a sun worshiper. Lenny was trying to acclimate to the environment and spend time with all of us. When I mentioned to him that I could see his ears were getting red, he showed me the backs of his knees and ankles that were already pink. That's enough sun for me, he announced. I'm going inside. I had to watch Joey very carefully when we were out on Sai's deck next to the pool because the house was not child-friendly. Joey's curiosity got the best of him when he looked through a wrought iron fence to the ocean. His head got stuck between the bars. Without making a scene, I helped him free himself. A little while later, I went back into the house and saw that Lenny was suffering. He told me, my skin is killing me. I'm burning up. Joey and I stayed at the house with Sai's housekeeper while Lenny and his dad ventured back into town to find some relief. Upon his return, Lenny had a big smile on his face. His fantasy pharmacy experience was actualized. In passing, he told me what he had just acquired to ease the pain. And about a half an hour later, he was in la-la land. Nothing new to me. That's just what life was like then. The smell of chili relleno wafted from the kitchen. We had all gathered around the table and had a little feast. It was the best chili relleno I've ever had in my life. Sai announced the next day he was going to take us for a boat ride. A seasoned fisherman, he positioned himself freestanding at the helm. The boat was originally a speedboat that Sai had adapted for fishing, and it accelerated quickly as we left the shore. Lenny sat with Joey while I had to lie down because I was starting to feel nauseous. If only I'd known that fresh ginger was the remedy for nausea, but I wouldn't learn that until many years later when I lived in Hawaii. For about two hours, the boat headed out to sea. Finally, I heard the engine starting to slow down and Sai announced, Here is Ms. Maloya, also known as Pelican Island. I sat up and looked out, and indeed, every inch of this small island was covered with pelicans. Slowly, he cruised the boat around the island in waters that were crystal clear turquoise. Then he revved up the engine and said, Now I'm going to show you the beach where the Night of Iguana was filmed. The engines were idling in this gorgeous beach cove when Sai told me that while he was sailing around the world, he had traveled through the Panama Canal. I was picking up reception of a Milton Berle show on my TV, and you were on it. Well, that really made me feel wonderful to hear my father-in-law say that he enjoyed me in front of his son and grandson. Only a month later, on March 15th, Lenny's friend Rye was celebrating his 25th birthday. Rye and I are only eight days apart. He was a huge proponent of train travel versus air travel, and so invited us to join a party that would take a train trip from Union Station in downtown L.A. to Santa Barbara. This was a very hippie-chic thing to do. Chugging along the Pacific Coast for three hours a party of at least 20 of us all carried picnic baskets of food. You could smell fresh French bread. When we arrived in Santa Barbara, we all walked from the station and caravaned across the railroad tracks to the beach. We spent a glorious day under canopies, which this time protected my husband's delicate skin. 
Joey instigated a sandcastle that he built with the help of his father until the sun started going down, and it was time to pack up and board the train again for the ride home. The last two months of my pregnancy, Lenny and Joey and I would go for a drive and house hunt. His old neighborhood in the Palisades was our focus, but on our way from Beverly Glen, we would ramble through the hills of Bel Air, admiring all the old architecture. Lenny found a house on the street where he grew up. It was designed by an architect named Cliff May, who was well known for his contemporary ranch-style houses that sometimes would accommodate stables for horses. Just west of the Riviera part of the Palisades is Sullivan Canyon, where Cliff May built his own estate. In the 30s, he purchased many acres of land in this area and had it zoned as equestrian-friendly. Once we saw a house with a magnificent coral tree on the corner, we put in an offer. This was not only the neighborhood where Lenny grew up, but it was where he established his foundation with the Newman family. This was where Lenny and Randy had played cowboys and Indians in Lenny's backyard. Randy would underscore their playtime when he was only a toddler. Call it fate, but this is where we would call home for the next decade. I was still very confused about my relationship with Lenny, and so in the days leading up to giving birth to my second child, I began a project. I really wasn't an artist per se, but decided to buy a large sumi brush and the least toxic black calligraphy paint I could find that would be safe for me to use in the state I was in, and set about creating a wall in our bedroom that was like a diary. The wall facing the bed was a series of closet doors that were very modern and a perfect surface for me to paint on. I began by designating heaven, earth, and hell. The first image that came out was of a mountain that looked like the profile of a gorilla. I truly believe that tapping into one's intuition reveals so much information because I was destined to move to Arizona where the shape of that very mountain existed. I drew pictures of me flying in heaven and weeping on earth, as well as raging in hell. To soften the visual effect, I hung quite a few plants from the beamed ceiling. After all, this wasn't just my bedroom. I shared it with the man who would have to encounter my thoughts even if he didn't understand them completely. Anticipating the birth of my child, I reached a point of storytelling on the wall that I felt could be covered by a fresh coat of paint, and so I did. I did paint over it by the time my new little one arrived. The night came around midnight when I started going into labor. Lenny was home in anticipation of the birth of a little daughter. How did we know it was a girl? <laughs> I'd been told that if I took my wedding ring, slipped it onto a, a long string, and held it very still over my belly, that if it was a girl, it would begin to move in a circle. If it was to be a boy, the ring would move side to side. It had worked with Joey, and it had worked this time, too. Sometimes those old wives' tales proved to be true. I went over to Lenny and said, It's starting. He replied, What do you mean? I just took my sleeping medication. I had a big bowl of peaches in the kitchen and brought him a big peach and said, eat this. Maybe it'll help you. Boy, was my timing bad for him. But as he was reviving himself, Lenny grabbed Joey and put him in the car. We had a long drive from Beverly Glen to Cedars of Lebanon. When we pulled up in front of the hospital, I was put into a wheelchair and admitted. In an uncomfortable moment for Lenny, he called my parents to watch Joey, and they were delighted to have their grandson with them. From the beginning, Anna and I had a precarious start. Her umbilical cord was wrapped around her neck inside the womb. Thank God Dr. Harris, my gynecologist, masterfully reached up inside me to untangle the cord and in full breech position gently brought her into the world. She was the most gorgeous creature I had ever seen. Her face was tiny, her cheeks were full, and her eyes were almond-shaped. She entered the world with two little curls on either side of her sweet pink ears. I had chosen her name Anna Jeanette, 
Anna because it was closest to mine, and Jeanette in honor of her paternal grandmother. Of course, Porto Vallada today is very much known as a tourist destination. It's somewhere that I would love to go uh, when we eventually open up the world again. Um, but it sounds like at that time it was a bit more of an undiscovered gem. Oh, in 1972, mm. I had never heard of Puerto Vallarta at that time. So I was totally enchanted with going to this small village by the sea mm. and, um, and experiencing, you know, a different culture. Um, and of course, that's why that's almost half a century ago. So, yes, I'll go with you. <laughs> It'd be wonderful. Um, you know, I even remember my my mentor, you know, traveling for years to Mexico with her family, even when she was probably in her 90s and just stories of that. But um I think from what I've read about Puerto Vallarta, it, it was really a combination probably around the 60s of uh, communal lands being opened up for development, the infrastructure being improved, and probably also the fact that the Richard Burton movie Night of the Iguana was filmed um, in various locations. And from what I understand, Richard Burton and Liz Taylor, not that Liz Taylor was in the film, but um, I think probably the publicity that was generated from the filming of that film and her being there during that time kind of made the world or at least the US quite familiar with that part of the world. <laughs> you know, there's so many places all over the world that are called the best kept secrets. It doesn't mm. last for long. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very protective of that kind of thing. When I find something, I'm like, I'm not telling anyone about this. But Yeah, um, good luck. Yeah, well, that's, uh, <laughs> and I think everyone's going to want to be traveling and as, you know, as, as soon as we all, we all can. And, you know, you talk about travel in the reading. It's, it's not just, you know, your own uh, travel during that time, but also Sai, who if we remind our listeners, was on his boat after his wife had died, he decided to sail I guess alone or with a small crew um, and kind of I guess work through some of the experiences of, of what had happened. Mm, yes well you and I have talked about grieving and loss quite a bit mm. and um, you know when someone that close to you passes you know and you're honoring yourself and the your loved one um, grieving is a very important energy to be in you know to be going through in a timely fashion without putting it off, you know, if it, and it's painful. So I think, you know, his choice to, mm. you know, traveling for that first year probably helped him. And especially his love of the ocean, his love of, of the water, that extra motion, you know, of, of uh, just dealing with, with your emotions uh, mm. is very helpful. And so, yeah. And, but grieving is just it's essential to honor yourself and go through that and i've heard that you know the first year is the hardest the second year is a little easier because you can step back a tiny bit mm. if if you're willing to go through it initially and and not put it off and i think probably sai was very fortunate in in some ways to be able to have that ability to um, I guess stop and and do that. Uh, I think I guess in everyday life it's often hard to you know for better or worse the world keeps moving and so it can be difficult to take that time. So to be able to take that time and particularly on a boat, as you said, with water and the importance of of you know water and and um, our connection to it and you know there's a lot of sort of theory about that about how we sort of have this connection to blue. I guess what they call blue space in the same way that we have a connection to green space. But I think anyone that's lived mm -hmm. near the ocean or even gone to the ocean uh, regularly can realize that there is some connection, whatever we want to call it or however we want to try to put a theory on it. Um, it's, it's very impactful. Yes. And blue, you know, for any of our listeners who are familiar with chakra, the mm. chakras in, in your body, um, the kind of portals, of energy, the chakra um, at your throat is the, the chakra of, of expression. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and the color, actually, it starts with the gemstone that resonates with your, um, with your fifth chakra. To count them, it's the root chakra, it's the 
uh, reproductive chakra. It's the kind of um, intestinal area, abdominal chakra. Then it's the heart chakra and the throat mm-hmm. chakra. So that's the fifth. Then it goes to the pineal gland and the crown. So there's seven, seven chakras. And um, it, but the color blue, it, the, actually the stone sapphire. Mm -hmm. is the true um, enhancement of that energy to be able to express yourself. So as you're saying, the ocean water is reflecting the sky and blue, (laughs) you know, unless there's (laughs) clouds up there or whatever is going on to change the color of of the water. I wanted to mention that uh, when you said he had the opportunity to, mm. you know, kind of stop, mm. um, you know, some people have to do it out of necessity, you know, mm. no matter what's going on, because it's emotionally paralyzing to lose someone. And I mean, your heart is broken and it's very hard to function. But in his case, he wasn't as young as I. He wasn't as young um, as many. He was a bit younger than the average person that would be able to stop. Because Mm. he started so young as well. Absolutely, yeah. He started so young. And and I think that's why uh, maybe he and I had a rapport. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense that, and of course, we are going to speak about that relationship as as we develop the the narrative, because, you know, it did go on, you know, even even beyond um, your divorce uh, from Lenny. Um, and I do kind of wonder, and even him seeing, you know, that Mildred Bell episode, probably a few years after it had been on and, and you'd kind of been out of that arena for a while by, you know, that point. Um, yeah, he probably related quite a lot to, to some of those experiences. <laughs> but you know what, in Panama, in Panama, I was probably current. <laughs> well, that's exactly it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> when he was traveling through the Panama Canal five years, it's, <laughs> that's probably the the rate of uh, you know of how these things circulate and um, um yeah, i don't know yeah. if it was a replay or what but... well you know milton bell uh wherever <laughs> there's a tv you know he would appear we used to have the same you know here that for years we were behind in you know like days of our lives and young and the restless and you yeah. know, uh, some like five <laughs> or six years and it's like dr tom's dead what when Ooh. and then you realize how long ago that was but um <laughs> yeah i i think that's a great you know it's a great little story that it could pick up reception and that's that's what would that's what would come on but um you know to talk about i guess expression you know we're talking about whether it's expressing grief expressing emotions that are unclear or have to be worked through uh when you talk about that whole idea of of doing painting to kind of express some emotions that perhaps were there but were unclear and and i guess quite in some ways fragmented or complex Mm, well i don't know if you have a tool in your toolbox that you turn to you know Mm. when words don't come as easily Mm. but you Mm. need to express yourself yeah that's actually quite an interesting one um i don't i see I guess I'm I'm in a very verbal job or probably more of a written job than a verbal job and I like writing. So a lot of it is kind of that. But what I find is it's that kind of writing where, as you said, if it's not quite coming together, it, it takes a while. You, you write something, you step away from it, you come back to it, you think about it, you rearrange it completely, you discard things, you, you keep things and you clarify thoughts. And, and it would be interesting to see what our listeners think about what they do to clarify thought, perhaps even without realising it, that they might just think they enjoy painting or drawing or whatever else. But it is actually or, a way to work through emotion. You know, or, or you say, where did that come from? How mm. was I able to do that? Because I'm not a, I'm not an artist. I'm not a painter. But, you know, something, something was kind of motivating me to do that. And, and it was very helpful. You know, it just, it was, I've heard so many things, for instance, I'm not to compare myself at all, but, you know, it's like, how did Mozart, maybe we talked about this, but how did Mozart at such an extremely young age, you know, be able to, in pencil, write 350 parts Mm -hmm. You know, and not erase one note. So for those who, you know, are open to a spirit channeling through you to, you know, help you, um, it doesn't really come necessarily from you, you. It comes Mm. through you. Mm. 
And mm. sometimes when I hold my, my pen to paper, um, I may be thinking about something, but that's not necessarily what goes on the page. Yeah. You know? mm. It's a mysterious kind of process that, that happens. Um, and, and I think that's why we call the creator the creator. <laughs> because <laughs> suddenly, you know, you have this, this bit of creation in you that just may just rush through you to assist you in, in you know, whatever stage of life you're in. Absolutely. It's that... Um, yeah, it's, it's such a mysterious process. And I'm even thinking about even in, you know, things like dreams where we get these images, um, or these symbols that sort of come through in dreams and it's not reality, but it is reality. And it's like, we're tapping into something else. There's some sort of unconscious, I guess, or something yes. trying to communicate with us. And I know a dream theory is a, a very big area and, um, you know, we could always talk about that. Um, down the track but this idea that we even have these kind of universal symbols that as humans we all have these universal symbols and so often they will be in our dreams because we've we've all got that I guess collective Mm. um, unconscious I'm yeah gosh um, things are things are changing rapidly these days and I feel it do you absolutely I think things are moving a lot quicker we've spoken about this quite a bit both in the podcast and, and away from the podcast that I think for so long and probably going back, you know, 10 years, of course, more than that, but we kind of felt like things are starting to shift and move and change um, and how long it's going to take and what's going to be the tipping point. And I guess we can, we all have our own ideas about what that tipping point has been in the world or what that change has been in the world. But um, yeah, I, I don't think there's a... <laughs> Well, for our holiday special, we have a very special guest. Our guest started out as a fan of Donna's in the mail room of the William Morris Agency. From there, he worked his way up through that company and beyond as a manager, agent, promoter, and record executive, working with the artists you've just heard and many, many more. It's my pleasure to tell you about John Hartman. John said on receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award for Excellence in Management in 2015 at the Talent Managers Association Heller Awards that you don't know you're making history at the time. Well, thanks to him, those he has worked with and John himself have made a lot of history. In a career as a manager and agent starting in that revolutionary decade of the 60s and spanning 50 years, John has worked with artists who have become legends. He was responsible for kickstarting the career of Chad and Jeremy in the US during the British invasion. His roster of US acts included the likes of Sonny and Cher, Joni Mitchell, Peter, Paul and Mary, the Eagles, Buffalo Springfield, Canned Heat, America, Poco, Crosby, Stills and Nash. Oh, and just a girl we know around these parts as Miss Donna Lauren. He's produced films, run a nightclub, and was voted Professor of the Year three times at Loyola Marymount University for his lectures on the entertainment industry. Talk about an insider's take in that class. We're so pleased to have John with us today and over the next several episodes. In this episode, John tells us about how he got his start as an agent at William Morris, including his work with the Colonel. That is Elvis's manager, Colonel Tom Parker. Ms. Donna, how are you? Uh, hi, 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 hi. How are you? I'm fabulous, you know, uh, just enjoying uh, the fruits of uh, a crazy life in showbiz and hanging out in Topanga. And You're a Topanga guy now? I've been a Topanga guy for 30 years. Oh, my God. Well, I mean, it's just one of my favorite places <laughs> on the planet. Yeah, yeah me too. Uh, well, I always say that Topanga is a place you get to, not a place you come from. <laughs> you know, you know, I almost, almost... Um, had an opportunity in like the early 80s when Billy Preston was having a tough time. He was selling his house on, I think it was Enchantment or Enchanted, Enchanted uh-huh. Way or Enchanted, something like that. Yeah. And he even had his white Bentley parked in the garage and it was a package deal. And um, he got on the phone with me. He was too embarrassed to, like, show me because I guess, you know, he was in in a difficult way or sensitive ways. But anyway, I almost became a resident 
then. Oh, wow. And I do love going there, John, because my husband's partner lives on Old Topanga for 42 years. Oh, wow. And we love going to the inn. And I'd love if you you and your wife, that would be fantastic to meet up sometime. Well, uh, yeah, I think when the, when the COVID era is over, that's something we should do. Okay. Uh, you know, we're, we're very uh, conscious of the, uh, the pandemic. And we never leave the ranch except to go to the grocery store. <laughs> and uh, we don't have any guests here anymore. Um, I think that's wise. That's so wise. Yeah. I think I think this thing is far from over and is certainly not under control. And I agree with I, you, I, John. You know, yeah. I went to yoga in 1969. I studied with the great Yogi Bhajan, who brought Kundalini Yoga to America. And I was in his very first class and I uh, got addicted to me. And I, and I went morning and evening you know, classes for two years. <laughs> and, um, and I really, you know, I, I, one of the things that he said, he was always saying these very wise things, but, you know, he said that, um, you know, if you um, w- want to live a long and healthy life, do your yoga practice and um, put it into your mind that you uh, will live to be 108. <laughs> okay and then I love and then that feed number. that idea feed that idea with your desire and mm. uh, and do it passionately and your brain will make you do the things that will get you to 108 i agree and, and and that ultimately becomes number nine which is the sacred number sure sure so i i've been practicing that you know i've been a yogi i've been a meditator since 1969 Mm-hmm. Uh, and I got very good at it. I, I, you know, not only was I teaching music business at the college level, but I also taught yoga at LMU. Mm. Uh, How does and, all uh, that unify? How did you integrate the two philosophies? Well, the practice of yoga and, you know, the incredible experience of music. Well, you know, music is the universal language. You know, it's, it's we, I can understand a song from Africa without knowing the words. <laughs> I, can I agree. Music. Yes. And you know, you know that because, you know, you lived in, in music all your life, but um, mm-hmm. it's a vibration. I found them very compatible, you know, like mm. yoga is essentially the union of vegetarianism, meditation and asanas. And, um, you know, if you do those things, all the other uh, dominoes <laughs> fall, you know, like, mm. and so I, I've been doing that a long time. And, and um, you know, I, I'm 81 years old, but I feel you know, I'm tell. still in my 40s, you know, <laughs> 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 which is which is really fun. You know, like um, I, I, I think it was um, Dickens or something like that that said, may you live in interesting times. Mm. And um I don't, you know, and we've been around a while, all of us. And, and the bottom line is, I don't think it's ever been more interesting. <laughs> it's uh, never been more interesting. Insanity. And you know what? We've got a youngster in our midst. Um, Adam <laughs> is, is barely 39. And so... Oh, oh. I have <laughs> yes, to say, though, John, I'm, I'm impressed um, with, you know, your, you know, longstanding interest in, in yoga and meditation and so on, because I think I'm starting to realize that even at 39 that I probably do have to take better care of myself. The other day there was a, a storm uh, here in Adelaide and I ran outside to rescue some pot plants and managed to sprain my hip and was kind of bed bound for a week. And I'm like, I don't think that's a normal reaction to what I did. So, you know, Donna, of course, being so interested in in uh, different modalities has really helped me to look at what, what I need to do so that I, you know, am in better shape. Well, there, you know... What a lot of people do yoga and and um, and a lot of people meditate, mm. but they want to they want to leave out the vegetarianism part of it, right. and and it's actually equally important. And mm. and the and Bhajan said this. He says, the very same systems in the body that deal with digestion are the exact systems that deal with rejuvenation and repair, and that it takes so long to digest flesh food. Hmm. That if you eat flesh food, chicken, beef, pork, you know, fish, whatever, once a day, just once a day, you never, ever get to rejuvenation and repair because it takes too long. And by the time you have that digested at 
usable as fuel, you're eating it again. Wow. And so you, you are not, not only shortening your life, mm. but you are inundating yourself with all the toxins that are in the meat products. And, and people say, okay, well, I'll just eat fish. Not, mm. and, and we say, no. Fish is actually worse because the fish that hits your table is the one that ate 15 other fish in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. we put hundreds of thousands of tons of mercury into the water system every year. Mm -hmm. And the fish have no way to get rid of mercury from their system, just like humans don't. So what happens is that fish is consolidating the mercury from all the other fish. Then you eat it. And it goes into your body and it kills you. So it can I ask a question? A very mm-hmm. toxic substance. Can so, I ask a question? Um, sure. it, now, uh, the reputation of mercury in fish is dedicated to like tuna. So you're saying no. in general. They all live in the same water, dear. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> the, the, the mercury gets on the plants they eat. It gets on the surface of the skin they eat. Any, you know, the, believe me, it's. It's not confined to one breed. Tuna has a better lobby. This is America. Money rules. Don't ever forget it. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I don't know how it is down in Australia, although I have been to Australia and loved it. I went on the road with the, the band America. Mm. I think what year that had been. I think it was around maybe 74. We went to Australia, New Zealand, Japan. Had a wonderful time, but uh, I stayed at the NOAA Hotel in Sydney. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I love I that had you a great time. that. That's great. It's a yes. good cue for, for some music, Adam, mm. right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm really interested, John. We're talking about you coming into these new practices in the, 19, the late 1960s. And, of course, we're going to talk uh, a lot about Shindig today in the mid-60s. But to go back even further, what started your love of rock and roll and music? Rock, rock around the clock. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, up until then, mm. me was a my parents' music, which was Sinatra in the big band era, and mm. uh, in my hometown in Brantford, Ontario, Canada, there was country music. I, I don't know why. I mean, we were in the I guess because it was South Ontario, so I was in the <laughs> South. But, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, I and I and I took all that, and there was uh, one. Uh, on Saturday morning, there was one radio show that played what was called the Hit Parade, mm. the top 10 songs. And so, you know, I was, not, I wouldn't say I was a fan. I was not a collector. I didn't collect records or anything like that. But um, I think it was probably uh, 56 or 7 when Bill Haley and the Comets hit with Rock Around the Clock. The song was in a film. Uh, it was the theme song for a movie called Blackboard Jungle. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With which was Glenn Ford and mm-hmm. um, and it was um, a high school. Yeah. And rock and roll music spawned a lot of youth oriented films. Mm. I mean, it exploded. And if you go on YouTube today, you can Google up movies from the 50s and they're all there's there's just tons of them about rock and roll. And so the song Rock Around the Clock hit with such enormous. Now, there have been other hits, you know, like like um, Johnny Ray's Cry. Mm. Um, you know, there, there were hits in that in, you know, what was emerging as rock and roll. It wasn't quite rock and roll yet. I don't think. Um, the term had been coined. Mm. Uh, It was eventually coined by uh, a disc jockey in Cleveland. Hello, everybody. How are you all? This is yours truly, Alan Free. Get your dancing shoes on and welcome to the rock and roll dance party. When, when Rock Around the, the Clock hit, I, I, was, I went to summer camp. And in those days, there was no transistor radios or anything like that. And the radio was a big box. <laughs> was, so, but in the office of the camp, there was a, a radio, one radio. And when that song came on, the word went across that campus in two seconds. And <laughs> every single person ran. <laughs> 
toward that radio, even fantastic. if they were only going to hear the last few bars. <laughs> right? That's and fantastic. So, and that infected me. And so I was now into rock and roll. And of course, that was um, the subject of Elvis Presley and the Sun Records era. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and it was huge. It was really huge. I was in high school. I was, um, I was, uh, let's see, when Elvis Presley hit, I was um, 17 years old, mm. 16, 17. And uh, I, I, met, I remember my older sister was old enough to go to Toronto to see the one foreign gig that Elvis ever did. Um, Elvis never played in Germany when he was in the army, never went to any I other know. country around the world. And the reason yeah. for that, if nobody knows, yeah. please um, tell us, is that Colonel Parker was a fugitive from Holland. Right. Ooh. Where he w- where he was wanted for murder. <laughs> what? Oh my and if he left goodness. the country, he could never get back in. He had no green card or, or resident uh, 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 citizenship. So Elvis has, was confined to America. That became easy when he scored in the movie game. Of course. So so th- that's how I got involved in music. Now, what I was really involved in was acting. Right. And in school, I was in all the plays. Mm. Oh. And um, when I, uh, I, I was, my family uh, came to the U.S. in um, 19, uh, ooh, say, 51 mm. to go mm. to the Rose Bowl to see Michigan uh, mm-hmm. play Cal. <laughs> and uh, they came home to Canada. And they said, we're moving to California. <laughs> now, I was a radio freak. Mm. I, I listened to all the sitcoms and all the dramas on the radio, and I did it obsessively. Yeah, I uh, I never sat at the dinner table with the family. I was always in the living room with my plate right on the big wooden box, <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's all I really cared about. And and when I got to be about eleven, I um, I was able to go to the local theater on Saturday morning by myself. Mm-hmm. So that's what I did. Now in those days. The um, going to the movies wasn't two hours in a cineplex. It was if, on a Saturday morning about nine o'clock. It would be a cartoon that would get yeah. all the kids settled down and in their mm. seats. That's then right. there would be a newsreel. Mm. Then there would be a serial. Something was That's right. fifteen weeks long, right? And it was yeah. kind of high adventure. Batman was one of them. Uh, a guy named Jungle Jim, you know, all kinds yeah. of those things, and and so you that was a cliffhanger, so that you'd come back next week to see what <laughs> happened. <laughs> And then there was um, a B movie, which yeah. was always a cowboy movie. <laughs> then the, in, in my town, there was a live stage show. Fantastic. Oh, wow. It could be anything. It could be uh, jugglers. It could be hypnotists. It could be a yo-yo contest, whatever. <laughs> and um, then the uh, feature would play. Mm. Then the whole thing would go all over again, except for the live show. Every Saturday, without fail. So you were there all day? <laughs> all day. You know, I would have popcorn and, and candy bars for lunch. You know, like <laughs> but I would stay all day, every Saturday, and I, and I was totally enthralled with Hollywood. So when my parents came home saying, we're moving to California, I was in immediately. Absolutely. I had an older sister and a younger sister. Mm. And um, we wanted to go to California. No question. And... My parents talked about this for seven years. Oh, my goodness. And all their friends moved to California. <laughs> and they had two more children. So now we're five. And wow. two parents. And in 1957, we moved to the United States as uh, permanent resident green card holders. Mm. No. Except we didn't go to California. Oh, no. We went to Maine, oh. which was oh north God. and colder. <laughs> mm-hmm. and what, so why on earth were you going also, to maine pardon me why on earth were you going to maine instead of california because my my dad got, um one of the friends of his who moved to the united states got him a job mm. um and working for a wholesale building materials company or at least a retail uh, let's see no yeah wholesale manufacturer of retail of um of building materials and and they he got a job in the united states and that was the thing you needed because we were English speaking, we didn't have a, an immigration problem in that yeah, sense, but you have sure. to be employed. Mm-hmm. So at least we're over the border. 
And um, <laughs> we, we spent we spent the summer in what's known affectionately in showbiz as summer stock. Yes. And, uh-huh. um, and I, I was the last one to arrive. And my family for the summer before my senior year of high school uh, got a cabin on a lake in a town called Monmouth, Maine. And every oh. summer, a, um, a theatrical company from Broadway in New York, total professionals, spent the summer in, in a thing called the Gilbert and Sullivan Festival Theater. And, um, and so this, I learned, was really a big deal. Every How week, fortunate. they put on a different Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. Mm. So now I show up. And, and I arrive at the cabin and my mother takes me aside and she said, did you see that terrible, awful house um, that looks like the Adams family wouldn't live in it uh, <laughs> on the way into town? I said, yeah, what is that? She says, that's where your sister's going to live if you don't get her away from that awful boy that lives there. Oh, <laughs> no. I went, oh OK, that, that's not good. And so I said, well, what's that wonderful, beautiful little building across the street? Oh, she says, that's the town hall and the theater and the library. And she said, next week, the uh, Gilbert and Sullivan Festival Theater starts and it's, uh, you know, goes all summer into the fall. And I said, OK, where, where's my sister? We're going to go get a job at, at that place. And so we walked up to the box office where a guy named Marty Green and his wife, Sarah, had just arrived. They were the he was the theater manager. My sister gets a job working in the box off with Mrs. Green, and and he uh, walks me into the building, which is a jewel of a building, just mm. totally well kept, painted cream with green trim, uh, old uh, Victorian style, and uh, he's, he he walks me. He says, "Come with me," and he says to me, um, "Do you um, know what a libretto is?" Mm-hmm. Well, I'd taken enough Latin to know that it had to do with books. And I said, yeah, it's a book. He says, do you know what's in it? And I went, well, no. <laughs> and he says, well, it's all the lyrics to all the songs in the opera. Mm-hmm. And so he walks me into this theater and he says, I need you to sell librettos. And here's how you do it. He, and he walks me up the stair. The, the theater, beautiful, just unparalleledly mm-hmm. beautiful little 300 seat theater. And uh, proscenium arch, you know, the real deal. And it was on the second floor and you had to walk up the staircase. It's kind Mm -hmm. of like circular. And he says, you put your table in the middle of the staircase. (laughs) And when the people come in, the woman always goes first. Uh You hand her the libretto as if it was free. And as soon as she's (laughs) past you, you hit the guy for the money. He says 99% of the time, he will pay. You yeah, get 50 cents. <laughs> and uh, the company gets, I think it was a, a buck or a buck and a yeah. half. Mm. And um, I said, okay, great. So I fall in with this, you know, theatrical company. And, and Donna will tell you, you know, theatrical people are much different from normal people. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm hanging with, you know, gypsy singers and dancers. And, and uh, mm. the guy who played the hero every week was a uh, PhD from um, LSU, Louisiana State University. And he was Mm. the handsomest, most wonderful guy with the Mm. greatest tenor voice. And he was just a real cool guy, but he didn't like hanging out with the, um, with the gypsies. Right. So um, he and I became friends and I would bring him over to our house every night for dinner. Mm. (laughs) And my mom loved having him. He was like the star of the town. It was all really fun. And uh, it it was truly wonderful. I mean, it was the most extended fun time I'd ever had. And when it was over, his name was uh, um, Morgan Stewart, but because of the actor, his name was James Stewart. But because Ah, there was a movie star named James Stewart, he called himself, he had to be called Morgan Stewart, which was, I think, his middle name, his last name. Anyway, he he had purchased a a 1949 DeSoto convertible mint to have (laughs) running around this little town all summer. And so um, he comes over to our house for the last dinner and we're, you know, and and he is on his way to New York City to join uh, the Ray Charles Singers on the Perry Como show. <laughs> One of the real <laughs> prestige gigs for singers, right? Yeah, for sure. So he comes to our house, and after it's over, he hands me the keys to the DeSoto. Jeez. 49 DeSoto convertible. 
And he says, <laughs> in his southern accent, he says, don't you all run out of gas now here? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at my parents and they nodded and I went, whoa, I'm going to my senior year of high school with a car. You know, but not only Ooh. that, a terrific car. <laughs> And um, so this cabin came with an outboard motorboat. And on, during the daytime, I'd buzz around this lake. It was maybe half a mile wide and two miles long. And there's dozens of those kind of lakes in Maine. And I was buzzing around in this um, outboard motorboat. And this guy in the speedboat comes zooming along. And he's doing wide circles around me. And he's coming in closer and closer. And finally, we wave. And we stop out in the middle of the lake. And the guy's name was Cyril Nolan, known as Cy. Mm -hmm. And he was going to be in my class senior year at Lewiston High School in Lewiston, Maine, a town a few miles away. And, I, and so he becomes my friend. And he invites me down to his house, which was fancy. His father was a jeweler. Had a beautiful little cabin at the end of the lake, red and white. It was just a really great little dock and everything. And he says, come on down Saturday night. Uh, because I'm having a party with a bunch of kids from our class, and I want you to meet my cousin, Celine. She's mm -hmm. gorgeous. She's a cheerleader. You know, you, you guys will get along. So I said, okay. And now, Marty Green was right. 99% of the time, the people bought the libretto. Mm. But on one occasion, one only out of hundreds and hundreds of librettos, I saw this girl coming up the revolving <laughs> stairs with a smile that mm -hmm. knocked me cold. <laughs> and uh, I got it in her hand, but she was with a college guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he got what was happening. He saw me do it to the ones in front of him, and he didn't. And he wasn't going to be suckered. And he, hand, he took it from her and handed it back and said, no, thank you. And I kind of laughed and said, okay, cool. You know, like... Um, you know, I don't have to sell them all <laughs> to everybody. And um, I made more money that summer than my father made that year. Wow. Oh my so gosh. I went to my senior year of high school with a, uh, a wardrobe that bought me, got me uh, best dressed in the senior class. <laughs> so I go down to Sai's house for the party on the Saturday night. And he introduces me to Celine Dumont, who is um, the, she won the uh, best actress in the state championship one act play contest. Oh wow. And it was that girl. Ooh. It was the same one. I love it. Love it. And I went, whoa. So uh, I went out for I was I was a big football star. I went out for one day at Maine and I said, these guys are trying to kill me. <laughs> and so I went out for the senior play instead, mm. where uh -huh. I played opposite I played opposite Celine Dumont in our hearts were young and gay. Uh, uh, yeah. Otis, uh, Cornelia Otis Skinner play mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, and had the time of my life. Now, the problem was that in the middle of my senior year of high school, my father got transferred to Meriden, Connecticut, mm. uh, you know, a couple hundred miles away. Mm -hmm. and, oh, no. and suddenly this idyllic life with all this wonderful stuff, and this great car. And I got the cheerleaders uh -huh. with the top down after winning the Thanksgiving game, game and just everything was the best it had ever been in my life. And suddenly I have to go. Yep. Mm. And luckily I, I had gotten in, Cy Nolan had gotten me in what was called the key club, which was a high school version of the Kiwanis club, which is a service organization here mm. in America. Ancient. So I, I quickly got into the key club in Meriden, Connecticut, and I finished out the, the school year. Um, I went off the, in the fall to Boston College for my freshman year of college. And while yeah. I was there, my parents moved to California. <laughs> oh, and so at the end of my freshman year, I took the last prop flight that TWA ever flew coast to coast from New York Thanks. to L.A. Wow. Oh, and it took goodness. eight hours. It rattled and it was going to fall out of the sky <laughs> at any second. And, everything. and I was three steps down the gangway and I was blown away. Yeah, I had left dirty, drizzly, gray New York City. <gasps> and I was now walking in the sunshine. You didn't go directly into the terminal in those days. You had to go mm. and walk across. So I'm three steps down the gangway and I went, wow, what is this? <laughs> And I became a Californian in that moment. Mm -hmm. I thought my father was driving the scenic mm -hmm. route <laughs> on the way home. It's just another highway, another freeway. And um, they moved to a little town out next to Disneyland called Garden Grove. 
Right. And when I lived in Canada, my brother, Phil, um, comedy actor legend. Absolutely. Murdered by his wife 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, oh, Lord. And, and, um, and we, my brother Paul and my brother Phil and I shared a bedroom 15 by 15 at best. <laughs> I show up at this house in Garden Grove, California, brand new tract home, beautiful, and I have my own guest house in the backyard. I'm going, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, a girl I met at another summer camp who was from California, lived, and I and the only pen pal I ever had, and I wrote to her for years. One letter followed, going ping ponging back and forth. Mm. She lived. She lived uh, ten miles from my house. How fantastic! <laughs> so now I'm home free, and she <laughs> takes me to Hollywood and shows me Grumman's Chinese Theater with the footprints mm. of all the stars. And takes me to the Hollywood Bowl and shows me something. Takes the first night she took me to a drag race. And oh I my god! Mean, um, I don't mean gay yeah, people in uh, men and women's clothing. I mean <laughs> that wasn't dragging back cars, then. right? And yeah, American like, graffiti. Uh, yeah, exactly. It was that night. It was Harrison Ford uh, and another car. And the funny thing was, it was exactly like in the movies. Girl waved her underwear, and the thing took off. <laughs> except one car uh, blew its transmission all over the pavement, <laughs> <laughs> and so the race ended with the other guys winning. So now, anyway, that's all going great. But um, my parents uh, were rigid Catholics. I escaped all that in my teens. So mm. not relevant to my life today or very mm -hmm. much after leaving home. But Understood, but yes. They wanted me to, con Boston College was a Catholic college run by the Jesuits. Mm. And they wanted me to have what they call a Catholic education. So I was supposed to transfer from BC to Loyola Marymount University here in Westchester, California. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, you okay. know, a, a neighborhood in LA. Mm -hmm. And I was never a good student, never studied, only crammed for the finals, always got by, but um, didn't really like it. So <laughs> then what happened was I go to LMU to sign up for my sophomore year. And they checked my grades from BC and they said, okay, we're, we're going to let you in, but you are deficient in, in English. I said, well, that's my best subject. They said, yeah, but you didn't turn in a book report and you got to go down to <laughs> Santa Monica College uh, down the hill here and you got to make up English, freshman English, and then you can come back here. Mm. So I go down to uh, Santa Monica College and I sign up for a full load, I don't know, 10 or 12 units. And one of the, so in those days, they did it with punch cards. So the, the counselor is saying, going through the cards at Santa Monica College, and she says, oh, you don't want that. No one should ever assume what Hartman wants. <laughs> right? okay. So I said, what, what is it? She says, well, it's uh, Theater Arts 1A. And I Ooh. said, you get points for that? <laughs> and she said, yeah, this is three units. I said, okay, well, I was in all the plays. I, I want to do that. Mm. And so I took that course. A month later, I dropped everything and took all theater arts. Oh, beautiful. James Dean had graduated from that college, you know, so that was enough for me. Right? <laughs> uh -huh. And and so um, I fell into that program. I, I won two acting awards in the next two semesters. Still mm. bored as hell with school. Oh, dear. And uh, and so this I, I would win. I would play the villains. And I would get um, Best Supporting Actor. Mm. My friend Bill mm. Gerber played the heroes, and he got the Best Actor award. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so he and I were both boarded of school, and and we decided to join the army. Wow! Oh, dear, and really? this is this is before Vietnam, right? Uh, this is there's no war going on or anything. Mm. But we figured out, and they had a thing called the Buddy Plan, and the Buddy Plan dictated that if you join up with your friend for two years that you, you're guaranteed to stay together through the whole process. Right. Mm. And whatever your assignment is, everything. So you always have a friend. Mm. Well, that turned out to be a total lie. <laughs> oh, nice. But um, Gerber and I go down to a federal building downtown L.A. at 6 in the morning, and we join about 280 other guys our age, mm. 19, 20 years old. Mm. And they're all there to be tested to join the Army. And it was no computers or anything. It was uh, newspaper, 
print size pages with a thousand questions on each page and there's mm. six pages. Okay. And so I bear into that and I do the best I can. And, and then they left all these kids, you know, in this big, huge room with a bologna sandwich and Coca-Cola and a cookie. <laughs> aye, well, aye, we aye. went crazy. We went crazy naturally and it ended up with food fights and <laughs> just a totally <laughs> fun chaos thing. And suddenly the door slam open and three guys stomp into the room and the sergeant, um, and a, and a corporal are on each side of a lieutenant and they call out John Hartman front and center. Oh God. And I went, Oh wow. And I turned to Gerber and I said, Hey man, you know, I did the best I could. I swear. I really <laughs> I don't know why they're picking on me. <laughs> so I walk up to the, in front of this lieutenant and I stand in front of him and he said, are you Hartman? I said, yes, sir. He says, okay, you got the highest score. You have an IQ of 154. We would like you to go to officer's candidate school. There's a bus leaving in 10 minutes, Mr. Hartman. Will you be on that bus? Wow. I said, no, sir. <laughs> and he flinched and said, what? He thought he had a live one. Right? And, and he says, what do you mean? No, I, he said, if I'm that smart, I'm going back to school. <laughs> he couldn't say anything to that. I did go back to school. Hated it just as much. Mm. And uh, and I decided that I'm going to New York to Broadway to become a famous actor. Right. And I and I go and I tell my teachers and they say, oh, you'll be marvelous. You're wonderful. Blah, blah, blah. I go to all my friends. I'm leaving. They give me they all give me maximum encouragement. And so now I literally am walking away. I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to drive to New York City and I'm going to become a Broadway star. <laughs> and. Um, as I'm getting to the parking lot, I hear someone calling my name. And I kind of half glance back and I see that it's this woman named Lillian Carter. Mm -hmm. And Lillian was a lady whose uh, kids had grown up and she went back to school for fun. And I had befriended her. She, we had some classes together. And, um, and I, I said, oh, no, I'm on my way. And I, and I don't stop. I just keep walking. This, this little middle-aged lady starts running. <laughs> and she says, John, John, stop, wait. And so I stop and I wait. And she said, I heard you were going to New York to be an actor. I said, yeah, isn't that great? She says, no, it's terrible. Don't do it. <laughs> and suddenly my bubble burst. And she said, did you ever think of becoming an agent? And I right. knew her husband was an agent at the William Morris Agency. Mm. Oh. Believe me, this is going somewhere. <laughs> um, and so... Um, she said, look, I'll get you an interview. And I said, well, I did interview there once and you never reacted. And she says, did you say that you wanted to be an actor? And I said, well, right. well yeah. I, I, it was on my resume. And she says, well, they don't want <laughs> actors. They got thousands of actors. <laughs> they want agents. So you're, I'm going to get you an interview and you're going to say that you always wanted to be an agent your whole life. <laughs> I said, yeah, Ma, no problem. You know? So um, I go, uh, and I now, uh, you know, I'm living at my parents' house in Westchester, which is fine. Mm. And um, I go home, and at dinner time, uh, the phone rings. And my mother says, it's for you. And this lady named Kathy Krugel asked me if I'm available to come in to meet with a guy named Ed Levy, which, who was HR, we'd call it today. I don't mm -hmm. know they, mm -hmm. they called it that back then. So I go in, I meet, I have, I have one suit that I wore to acting interviews. And, uh, and, uh, you know, um, it was a black mohair suit and I had a custom made shirt with my initials on it and a chain link watch and a pinky ring, a star sapphire. And, <laughs> and that was my outfit for going to an acting interview. And so I wear it in to see Ed Levy and, and apparently I passed and the that night I get a call. Okay. We want you to come in and meet Morris Stoller, the controller of the company. Yeah, and uh, they they give me a, an appointment the next morning, and and I go in and in the same suit. I didn't have to see Ed Levy again, so I didn't feel mm -hmm. like a badly about wearing the same suit. <laughs> and uh, and um, then it turns out uh, Morris Stoller was tied up in something, and this lady named Doris Levitt, who was not his secretary, she was his executive assistant. She comes out, mm -hmm. she interviews me. And uh, we headed off, and uh, I start the next Monday in the mail room for 50 bucks. Oh. So you actually started in, <laughs> and people talked about that, starting in the mail room, and you did, like literally. Yeah, believe me. I, and, I, and I was, uh, 
there's a character in a show called How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying named mm. Sammy Glick. <laughs> I was Sammy Glick. <laughs> I ran hard. I ran fast. I got first guy in, last guy out. No job too big, no job too small. Get it done, get it done right, get it done mm-hmm. fast. Hi, that's me, Donna Lauren. After an exhausting recording session, I always relax, refresh, and enjoy Dr. Pepper. And while I was doing that, there was this beautiful girl named Donna Lauren, who was a, a recording artist on Capitol Records and in a lot of um, these teenage movies I mentioned. Mm-hmm. And uh, she would come into the office on occasion, and I, she didn't know this necessarily. Well, she probably didn't know it. You, you can verify it, Donna. But okay. all the mailroom <laughs> guys were like totally enchanted with her. And whenever Donna came into the office, it would buzz around among, there was always half a dozen mailroom guys at a time. And we'd all be going out of our way to walk by her in the hall, <laughs> you know, just to see her. And, and she was charming to everyone and, and probably didn't know how low on the totem pole we were, but, but we were all fascinated by Donna. And um, she, I remember she wore, I don't know, did they call them pedal pushers? Those, yeah, those uh, tight tight pants with the pedal pushers or capris. Going, yeah, well, well, we you know we well we were just all like enchanted by Donna. So then uh, I go through um, six months, and I'm the fastest guy in the mailroom, and Colonel Tom Parker right. um, mm-hmm. signed Elvis to the William Morris Agency, and when he did so, he. The colonel, as I learned when I worked for him for the better part of a year, he always got something free in the deal. And he would he would throw those things on the table, those freebies, after all the boilerplate of the deal was confirmed and locked up. So it didn't really alter anything. And nobody wanted to turn down these things over, uh, you know, um, getting out because because they already got them. We got Mm -hmm. Elvis. We don't have, you know, so what what the colonel asked for was three things. He said. I need a station wagon owned and serviced and gassed by the William Morris Agency, but right. in t- my total custody, usable by me full time. Well, that was nothing. William Morris had 50 cars in, in the fleet or more. Uh, so that was easy to get. The second thing he asked for was a full time William Morris employee on his staff. Mm. Paid for, insured, and everything else. I don't even know if they had health insurance back then. Um, but w- he was a William Morris employee, but he worked for the colonel. Right. Now, the guy who had that job was a guy named Irv Schechter. And Irv went into the uh, Air Force Reserves every year for two weeks. Mm. The colonel was such a Dickler and a hard-nosed guy that he would demand another guy for those two weeks. Kathy Krugel, who was in charge of all us mailroom boys, said, uh, okay, chose me, Hartman, to go be Irving Schechter's replacement for those two weeks because I was the least likely to screw up. <laughs> and she was protecting her own butt, right? Of course, yeah. <laughs> so, so I go and I report to Colonel at um, Paramount Pictures Mm. The main building, he had the entire half of the second floor of the main building, which he got as a freebie in a deal with Hal Wallace, the oh, film God. producer who had the other half of the floor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And every, it was a seven room suite and every square inch of the wall space was covered with a picture of Elvis. <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> so I go in there and my job is to do whatever the colonel says it is mm. <laughs> right now, right? And it was pretty simple stuff, you know, running for errands. I would go to all the studios and pick up Elvis's fan mail. Um, and uh, I would go to the newsstand at Dupar's right across the street and buy every magazine and every newspaper that came out. And then I would, my job was to go through all those periodicals mm. to discover anything about Elvis. Whatever I found, I cut out and sent to a warehouse in Madison, Tennessee. Mm. and um if i found anything unusual in the fan mail i sent that there too like if it was a trinket or yeah something like that 
And um, Elvis had done movies at just about every studio, so there was uh, there was a lot of um, stuff let me all coming and going, and so that, that was my job, and, you know. And, and we, er, then then two weeks later, on the Friday, I go to the colonel. I say, Colonel uh, Irving, will be back on Monday, and and it's been a real pleasure, and I certainly uh, enjoyed uh, working with you, and hope I get to see you again. And blah blah. And he says, Oh no, Johnny. He says, uh, You come back here Monday too. Cause, and you know, and um, he says, I got a job for you guys, big job. And I went, well, they're expecting me back at the office. He says, Don't worry about that. I'll handle that. That was the end of that. You did not debate with Colonel Park. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, he was not a warm and fuzzy guy. Uh, mm-hmm. So, so you do what he says. So, I now he's got two guys. <laughs> yeah, the the big job, like one Colonel always wanted to blow minds. He always did something to get everybody excited. And he had a habit. Uh, he kept track of every star in show business, every professional athlete, every senator, every congressman, and every governor, and anybody heavy anywhere. And every year he sent them uh, a, a manila envelope with a wall size calendar and a pocket size calendar with a picture of Elvis on it. And it said, and it was always signed Elvis and the Colonel. Mm. He got billing every time. Mm. So, so the thing, so uh, the other thing to blow minds is uh, he would save these things up to the week before Christmas. And then he would send them all down to the Paramount mail room and the same day just to blow minds. And there were thousands. Mm. They, they were stored. We, Irving and I had packed them all and addressed them, but we uh, had stored them in big, um, what we called trunks, mm. like, you know, travel trunks, I guess you'd call them. Anyway, there, there were dozens of these big, huge trunks full of these envelopes, and, and the big job the colonel had, he had discovered a little thing, I don't even know what it was called, but it was a propeller on the end of a stick that had ridges in it, and you rubbed another stick on it, and the propeller would go around. Right. He decided to put one of these in every one of those envelopes. <laughs> and it, it took us, you know, a month to do it. Mm. And then and then he didn't want me and Irving to kill ourselves carrying all these trunks down in the mailroom. So he called over to the Memphis Mafia and had them come over. That's fantastic. Um, Red West and, and all those guys and they and they delivered them downstairs. Um Elvis was at the height of his movie career. He was doing a, a film called Girls, Girls, Girls at Paramount. And, you know, the colonel would have a butcher's coat that said girls, girls, girls all over. And, he'd, <laughs> and, um, and so one day I, I was on the set and uh, these tourists came along. To, and somebody the colonel was hosting. And, and uh, he called Elvis over and I happened to be standing there. And, and he introduced us all to Elvis. And it was just a hello. Um, but I had met the king of rock and roll. Yeah. Yeah. So now this goes on for another eight months, except they go over to MGM to make a movie called It Happened at the World's Fair. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, shooting yeah. at MGM. Mm. And so they left me alone back at Paramount to man this seven room suite. Now, every square inch of this suite was covered with a picture of Elvis, except the colonel's office. That was all him and Elvis with heavyweights. <laughs> but everything else was some kind of promotional uh, material for Elvis. It was a, a one sheet for a movie. It was a, a pennant that was in store displayed for an album. It was these little wallet sized calendars. It was big calendars. It was all put up haphazardly. Mm. And it really mm. um, kind of aggravated my Virgo mind. Oh. I was, every, everybody <laughs> knew where the... Uh, where the uh, Colonel and Elvis were and, and no one phoned. I got a phone call at 9 a.m. to make sure I was there. I got a phone call at five to one to tell me to go to lunch. I got a phone call at five after two to tell make sure I was back from lunch. And I got a phone call at five to tell me to go home. The rest <laughs> well, of the time I sat there reading the fan mail going crazy. <laughs> and I decided uh, out of pure boredom to take down all the pictures of Elvis. Oh, and no. put them all up symmetrically. I love it. <laughs> uh, so the little wallet size were the border at the ceiling. Oh, excellent. Then these, these pennants that oh, went in record stores hung down, and then the one sheets, and, and, and it was beautiful. It, it just was a work of art. I want to see that. And the funny that. thing is, when, when they come back, 
Oh, so then one day I get a call over at MGM and uh, I'm supposed to bring this envelope that came in the mail for the colonel's some contract. And so in those days I had a, this funky old, um, it was a, uh, what year would that be? That would be like a 55 Ford convertible, mm. which, which the, the roof was split on both sides, oh stem to stern. <laughs> And and when you drove with the top up, it flapped in the wind, and there was a big hole <laughs> on each side of the car. So now I so here I am. I've draw, driven on the lot at MGM, and I walk into the Colonel Secretary Jim O'Brien. He says, uh, "Okay, go on right in, Johnny." And and I walk in. The Colonel's sitting there, and he says, "Oh, Johnny, come in." And he says, "You know Elvis," and Elvis Presley was standing there, leaning up against the wall the most magnificent human I'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was like being in the room with a fire. Mm. Because I was a fan, you know, and I'd only been a fan twice before, once before, Humphrey Bogart, when I saw African Queen, I was 15 Mm. years old. And um, and then, and I wrote Humphrey Bogart a letter, fan letter, and I never heard back and I was pissed at him. (laughs) I remember that for the rest of my career, the fan (laughs) wants to be honored and recognized. Mm, <laughs> right. Yeah. So anyway, um, Elvis, couple, I know that you, in the mailroom, you had to wear a tie and a suit and whatever. And, and Elvis walks over to me and sticks out his hand and says, how do you do, sir? Because wow. he was a good old country boy who respected yeah. a suit and tie. <laughs> right? Yeah. And um, and I said, how do you do? <laughs> and I was like a little in shock. Colonel signs the paper says, OK, Johnny, wait outside. You can drive me home. And um, so, I, yes, sir. And I, and I go and I'm walking toward the door and Elvis walks over and he opens the door for me and he says, see you, man. <laughs> As only he could say it. A lot <laughs> right? of and I walked out of there yeah. four inches off the ground and I wait for the colonel. Colonel wanted, you know, he, he wanted to sit in the back of this funky old Ford like it was a limo. Right. Oh, and, funny. Uh, yeah. And so. Archie, come in. Come in, little boy. Good boy. Sweet boy. Yeah. Um, You've got to talk so well. We're driving yeah. through. We're driving through this famous MGM arch, you know, uh, that is like been in many movies, and it's of just course. like a very famous place. And the Colonel sees Robert Whiteman, the um, chairman of MGM Studios, walking mm-hmm. toward us, and we're right in the middle of the arch, and he says, "Stop the car." I stopped and, and, and the arch was old, made for little cars in the olden days. So I literally filled mm-hmm. the arch with one <laughs> Ford. <laughs> and so Robert Whiteman, he waits for Whiteman to get close to the car and Whiteman has to kind of squeeze by. And as soon as he gets adjacent to where the colonel's sitting, he sticks his hand up through the hole in the roof and he says, Mr. Whiteman. <laughs> and, and Whiteman God. goes over and he looks through the hole down in there. Is that you in there, Colonel? <laughs> and I'm just beside myself. Huh? This is the funniest thing I've ever seen. And uh, what a visual! And he says, "Yeah." He says, uh, "Be sure and go by the set and say hello to Elvis." And Whiteman says, "Yes, I will." Blah blah. <laughs> and he carries on, and the Colonel says, "Home," you know. <laughs> and I drive him home, and I'm practically laughing out loud the whole time. And <laughs> and the Colonel's actually laughing a little bit too, which is not his normal <laughs> stance. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I use the lightheartedness as a chance. I said, Colonel, what's the object of personal management? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he says, the object of personal management is to build duration into the act. Right. Okay. Now, Elvis makes more money today than he did when he was alive. So the Colonel accomplished his goal. <laughs> mm. um, and so anyway, I, I take him home. I, I continue at Paramount. They finished that picture. And I'm bored, silly. And I, I lobby. Tom, the colonel had a, a, another free guy. He was paid for by RCA Victor Records. Mm. Uh, he was a publicist named Graylin Landon. And then he had, and he had the secretary, Jim O'Brien. He had me and Irving. And he had another guy. And this guy, his name was Tom Diskin. Mm-hmm. And Tom would have been his partner, except the colonel was too big to have a partner. But this guy mm-hmm. was his right-hand man. And uh, he told us, well, they all, but they all told us great stories of Elvis. I don't want to take up this time to 
elaborate on any individual story, but mm. I started lobbying Tom Diskin. Look, my career's not here waiting around for you guys. It's back at the Morris office. You got to get me out of here, Tom. And so he went to the mm-hmm. colonel and said, look, John's eager to get back to his career. You know, we should let him go. He's done great. Blah, blah. Mm. And so the colonel calls me into his office on the next Friday and he says, okay, uh, you know, understand you want to go back to the office and I understand it's your career. And, um, you know, so, you know, you go back there and I've talked to them and you're going to be out of the mailroom. Right. Oh, I go, oh, great. You know, and I even got a little raise. I was maybe making mm. now 150 bucks a week. And so now the, the second phase of it all is that you become a, pro- a secretary in a secretarial pool. Mm. So when someone's out sick, you replace that secretary for that day. And um, in the course of it all, I worked in every department. I worked in legal. I worked in accounting. I worked in TV. I worked in film. I worked in theater. I mm. mean, wherever they needed help. Mm. Uh, that day and so one day i ended up with a movie agent named cy marsh who had big stars uh, movie stars and sammy davis jr and Mm. jane powell and Mm. burl ives and they were all kind of musically oriented clients he had uh, george securis when he won the academy award for west side story and the same with rita marino Mm. and uh, it was just a great place to be and my my goal was to become a movie agent Mm. So, so I, um, I, I went to work for, as this guy, Cy Marsh's private secretary, and, and Cy Marsh was a frustrated comedian. And my brother was Phil Hartman. Mm. We were roommates. I was a great audience. <laughs> so I was laughing. Great. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and so I was always laughing because Cy was funny. He, he could have been mm. a stand up easily. And uh, and so they came to me and said, look, you guys are having too much fun. Um, <laughs> you got to go back in the secretarial pool. Mm-hmm. And so, OK, and Cy and I kind of bid adieu. Uh, this was 63. And so I went back to the secretarial pool. And one day I get uh, uh, assigned to go work for a guy named Jules Shar. Mm-hmm. Jules Shar was the head of the variety television department. Right. In those days, I'm leaning towards Shindig now. Don't be <laughs> impatient. <laughs> and so the um, variety in those days, there was 15 hours of primetime television a week where there was comedy variety shows hosted by every major singer. Yeah. So Don't Nat, you just miss Nat that? Nat King I Cole, that. Perry Coma, uh, Andy Williams, Dean Martin, um, you know, every big singing star got his own TV show. Fantastic times. And so, <laughs> and so that I found fascinating. Mm. And uh, I, I worked for Jewel Shar for about eight months. And then one day, oh, oh, here's how I got that job. So, so they sent me down to work for him. And he's tough. He's tougher than the colonel. He's mean. He's a closeted gay. He's just um, fastidious beyond belief. Mm. He wanted everything exactly this way every time, yeah. always, boom. And um, so I went back to uh, Kathy Krugel. says, I want to work for him full time. <laughs> and she said, are you crazy? Everybody works for him, leaves crying. <laughs> That's why you were there. I said, no, but he's not boring and I'll learn something from this guy. Mm-hmm. So he calls up Char and he says, the kid wants to work for you. I'm, I'm 22. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. And um, he says, oh, yeah, get him down here. So I go down and I stand in front of Shar and he says, what, are you a smart guy? You think you, 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 know, you can handle me? Is that what you think's going on here? I said, yes, sir. He said, okay, we'll see. So I become his private secretary and he tries to break me. Mm-hmm. And he just, I won't bore you with all that either, but it was, you know, he really tries to break my spirit. He wants me to quit. And he gives me a hard, hard time. And, um, and I take it all. Now, Burl Ives, I mentioned, was mm. a great folk singer in America who became a big time character actor in film. Oh, major yeah. role. Absolutely. And, um, Fantastic. He was managed by his wife. And yeah. she right. committed the cardinal sin for, for management, which is to book an artist in two places at the same time. <laughs> no worse sin can be committed. <laughs> and she tried to blame it on me. Char oh, was using it to bludgeon me verbally. Oh, no. And I finally broke. 
Mm. And I went into his oh. office, I slammed the door, and I screamed at him for a full oh. minute without breathing. <laughs> and I, as, I, as I'm getting into the last 20 seconds, I'm like, oh, wow, I just got myself fired. Mm. I'm going to be out of here in a minute. And um, when, I, when I, I stopped, and he looked at me, I looked at him, and he said, are you through? I said, <laughs> yes, sir. He says, okay, can we go back to work? <laughs> Fantastic. And that sounded right. I said, yeah. He says, mm. get me Jane Powell. Oh, no, it was, it was um, get me uh, Mae West. Oh, he called her Miss oh West. dear. <laughs> that was one of his clients, right. And I had a relationship with Mae West because he hardly ever, he never took her call when she called in. He would always call her from his office in private, and he wouldn't let me listen on those calls. Mm. He did on many many of the arts. So I learned how to talk to a, an artist mm. and how to treat a star without becoming a sycophant and all that sort of thing. And, mm. um, and so I, uh, I, I get May wet and she was really wonderful. She was body and um, Donna, you'd have loved her. Donna was a little body. Oh, though. honey. I love her line. <laughs> I love it. Um, but May West said to me one day, she says, you're not one of those sissy boys. Are you Johnny? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, Miss West, I, I'm not. And she invited me out to her house for oh, a wow. seance, a oh. seance with um, a guy named Peter Herkos, who was a psychic, I guess you'd call him. And I went out to her house, and she had 25 people in this room, and Herkos came out and did his act. I was met at the door by muscle, like Arnold Schwarzenegger-sized guy in a tuxedo mm. who showed oh, me man. the room. And walking through the room, there were these monkeys on stands in tuxedos. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and uh, we went in and we did the whole Peter Herkos act I won't bore you with. And um, she never showed. Oh, She never no. came to the whole evening's entertainment. Oh. So I, I, I'd only gone there to meet her. I didn't, her? I didn't yeah. know about Peter Herkos or any psychics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, but it was fun, and you know, and it was great to be able to say that I, you know, went to May West House. Um, totally. So anyway, time time goes by, and a, a few months later, Jules comes in and says, "I'm leaving the Morris office, and I'm going to Ooh. be the head of Variety, all Variety, which included live concerts as well as TV and theater." Yeah. At uh, an agency called IFA, International mm -hmm. Famous Artists, mm -hmm. and he said. Um, I got you promoted. You're going to be an agent. Go see Phil Weltman. He was Fantastic. the guy who promoted us. Mm -hmm. So I go, I go see Phil Weltman, and he tells me that I'm now a junior agent. And I'm assigned to the, – there's the agent's job is threefold. Mm. You sign artists, you sell artists, and you service artists. Mm. Mm. That means go to the gig when they're there and make sure everything works out. Mm. Or you take them to lunch and dinner if they're upset or whatever, right? <laughs> and um, so I move into an office with a guy named Mike. The, the hierarchy at William Morris, they start you, they keep you humble. They keep <laughs> you really humble, starting with the 50 bucks a week. <laughs> but, you know, they don't give you an office. You share an office and uh, you, you don't get a couch, you know, that's just desk. You know? mm. So there were three guys in this office and one was donna's agent for movies right. Andy Bressler. Mm. and uh, and one was alvarado who was in charge of theater mm. and me who was in charge of scale television shows and game shows right mm. which happened to be a fabulous arena mm. because i all, all the talk shows were scale television so i spent mm -hmm. my time with superstars on the Tonight Show, the Steve Allen Show, and all the game shows, and all these places, I, I, I learned how to be with stars. Mm. Now, Shindig was a scale TV show, right? And uh, Sandy Bress, I did not actually make Donna's booking on Shindig. I didn't. Who would that have been? Deal. Would that have been Sandy? He did, or? right? Because he was your contact, and uh, okay, and so. Um, but I had the show, so I took it over. Mm -hmm. Sandy had also booked the director, Dean Whitmore. Yeah. Right. And um, when I took over, I booked, um, I had a client of mine called Dick and Dee Dee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I got them on the show as regulars. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I later signed the Shindogs, the quintet, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. 
to the Morris office, although ABC wouldn't let him do anything. So that was futile. Wow. And, mm. um, and then I signed, uh, uh, then I, of course, and then I took over. You won me over. That's all for now. Next time we'll hear John's experiences on the Shindig set with Donna. Until next time, remember, love's a secret weapon. Yes, love.